this whole bigger is better mode that everybody's in these days, I think is the recipe for disaster for people. And the Bible is very clear when it says no man can serve two masters. He's going to love one and hate the other, or he'll worship one and he'll chafe under the other one. And I think as we start to grow our kingdoms of real estate bigger and bigger, all we're doing is creating another master. We spend our time, for me, I'm going to spend my time in the cockpit worrying about, is my property being managed correctly? Instead of watching that dolphin surface next to me. So welcome to the Freedom Chasers podcast, where we bring you interviews and discussions that share the stories, successes, goals, and dreams of real estate agents and real estate investors pursuing a life of purpose and freedom. All right, guys, I am super fired up to have Dave Foster. I met Dave Foster on another podcast where we were talking about current events and all these things. I found out this dude lived on a boat and raised his family on a boat, nonetheless, I think for like 10 years, if I have that right. But he is not like a stationary kind of guy. He's the kind of guy that is a real estate junkie, serial entrepreneur, 1031 expert that has let real estate leveraged it to work for him instead of the other way around. So Dave, thank you so much for being gracious enough to come on the show. Take us in right away. Like what led you to want to live on a boat? Uh, thanks. It's, hey, it's my pleasure to be here. You know, when they brought us on there, they thought they were bringing us on as experts, right? But what they forgot was that Obviously, you're the expert. I'm just old. <laughs> so I've lived long enough to make the mistakes. You have so much expertise. I'm so excited to dive into it. So, to, so tell us That's about this awesome. boat. Yep. Well, real estate. I mean, I'm a, I'm a child of children of children of children of landowners. When my family came over, we settled most of South Central Kansas back in the late 1700s and 1800s. So Land and real estate has always been something that's been in my bones. I mean, I can recall grandparents and relatives saying things like, uh, you know, hang on to the land. The only two people in history that have never, that have always ruled the world are landowners and bankers. And I knew I didn't want to be a banker. I got way too much ADD for that. So I grew up just having an affection for land and real estate. Now, what happens though, like always, is you get derailed, don't you? Life catches up, you all of a sudden find a career, meet somebody, things happen. And mid 1990s, I was in a totally different career. My wife was in a totally different career for me. And this magical moment happened. We had our first child. And all of a sudden, the first thing that happened was we threw away the TV because you have no more need of entertainment. That little <laughs> kid is all you need. And we also realized something that we had forgotten, which was that the greatest commodity that anybody has, your listeners, anybody in the world, the greatest, most, most important commodity we have is time. It's not money. Money can be made. Time cannot. You've got what you've got and you got to use it well. And we said, well, wait a minute. We're going to be pursuing two careers. What we really want is to be with this little thing that we just created. And so we began to think, well, wait a minute. How can we leverage? That's a great word for that. How do we leverage the rest of our life in order to be able to maximize the limited amount of time that we have? And all the voices and ghosts of my relatives past kind of kept coming back to haunt me. And I said, honey, Let's become real estate investors. She said, sure, why not go for it? So as a typical add or would do, I went out and I practiced very diligently the art of ready, fire, aim. I bought a duplex. I fixed it up. I sold it. Life was good. We're about to embark on this great journey. Until I went to my accountant at the end of the year and he said, dude, boy, are you going to pay some tax on this? And I went, what? He said, don't you realize that every real estate investor has a silent partner? And his name is Uncle Sam. And if you're not careful, your partner's going to make more money than you. And I looked and said, yeah, this is not going to work. We've got to figure something else out. 
right at that point. I'm, I'm a degreed accountant. So I've got all the heart of a marketer and all the nerd of an accountant. But right at that moment in time, there was a big court case that had been settled where the IRS lost over a statute called Section 1031. And what Section 1031 allowed people to do was in particular big farmers and industry owners to sell real estate and heavy equipment, big stuff, and use those proceeds to go purchase bigger farms, more equipment, and by doing so, not have to pay the tax. Because if that statute was not in place, what would have happened in that part of our nation's history, this went into play in 1920, by the way, what would have happened that all of our nation's farmers who wanted to grow couldn't do it? Because by the time they sold their property, paid the tax, they wouldn't have had enough money to go buy the new property. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So that's why the statute was in play. Well, the IRS lost a court case where a normal guy named Starker used this to buy and sell regular investment properties. All of a sudden, there it is. The door is open. That's the answer. Because instead of having to pay my silent partner, I can now take that tax and use that to leverage my portfolio and get the benefit from that. So it becomes what Albert Einstein supposedly called the eighth wonder of the world, right? Compound interest. I get to make money on the tax. And then when I sell that, I make money off of the money that I made on the tax. And I can do that indefinitely. So all of a sudden we were back on track. And, and I want to I want to dive in here yeah. a little bit. Because for those that have not used 1031 exchanges, it is a glorious thing. But it is also like getting on a roller coaster that doesn't end, right? I mean, can you give the the listeners, because like once you've 1031, the taxes aren't gone, right? They're deferred. So to talk about what maybe the pros and cons are of the 1031. Got it. Yeah, let's give people some hope yeah. for the end of the day, right? Yeah. And then we'll come back and I'll show you how we use that. So... The 1031 exchange, like you said, it doesn't eliminate the tax. It simply defers it. By the way, it also defers depreciation recapture. Now, that's kind of a two-mile deep concept, but basically depreciation is this pretend gift that the IRS gives you yearly. They let you pretend that your property loses money, loses value, and then you get to write that off on your current tax year. The problem is when you sell your property, the IRS makes you pay it back. So it's not a permanent gift, jerks. Mm -hmm. But the 1031 exchange allows you to defer that as well. So not just any gain that you get on the property, but also any benefit that you take while you own the property gets deferred as well. And it does get deferred indefinitely until you either sell and don't do a 1031 exchange or you die. We'll talk about that in just a second. But so what I like to call the four T's of 1031 investing. You ready? We'll, we'll see how good Tim is with this, right? If he's on. So the first D is going to be defer. Because as long as any time you sell a piece of property, you will defer the tax. Now, you can defer and you can go buy, sell in any part of the country and buy in any other part of the country. You can sell any type of investment real estate, and you can buy any other type of investment real estate. It doesn't matter. As long as you continue to do the 1031 exchange, you'll defer the tax. Why is that important? Because usually we move, or our life cycle as we go through life causes us to want to change the type of investment that we want to go into or where it's located. So that's important, that first D. So Tim, since you're still there, what's the second D? I love how you put me on a the spot there, Dave. I'm, <laughs> not, <laughs> I'm Matt not sure. Told me to. Oh, Matt told you to. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling yeah. you, I'm throwing him under the bus. <laughs> well, okay, I'll give you this one. You gotta come back with it. The second D is defer. And again, this goes along with our life cycle for investing because we typically like to start out with things that we can afford. And generally we end up buying bigger 
or buying more, right? So you can use the 1031 exchange to sell one property and buy several properties, or you can use the 1031 exchange to buy multiple properties and combine them to purchase a larger property. Whatever direction your life is going, you can use the 1031 exchange. Now, along with this, as part of a growing experienced investor's portfolio, they'll also be looking for places to invest where there are what I call holes in the market or where there's not a market equilibrium. The place that time hasn't discovered yet. Now, our window for finding these because of the internet is much less. But while people in California were happy to were uh, happen to pay hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for properties here in Florida, we were still buying them for great almost beachfront properties for hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars. That's an inequity where you can take a highly appreciated asset and go invest somewhere else into something where appreciation hasn't found you yet. Or to change from investing for appreciation into investing for cash flow. All of those things will work. And as long as you continue with that second deed and defer, you will never have to pay the tax. And you'll always get to use that for your benefit and your investing. So you ready, Tim? What's the third D? I think I've caught a pattern. So I'm going to go out on the limb and I'm going to say the third D is defer. Yes, we didn't have the bells going off and everything. Absolutely. And here's why. Because again, as I go through my life, I'm continuing to build up all of this deferred tax. So I need some exit strategies, right? The first exit strategy is that I place these properties near where I want to retire. And that allows me to take those and manage them throughout my retirement very efficiently and accommodate me with my lowering energy, right? Or what I may want to do is turn them into a type of investing that's more passive and go from active to passive investing. Types of syndications called Delaware Statutory Trust that can accommodate 1031s, larger multifamily properties that have management in place, commercial properties, they're what we call triple net, where the tenant pays all of the tax and insurance and maintenance. All those kinds of things can accommodate me later in life. Or I may find that it's to my advantage to slowly convert my properties back from investment to primary residence. Why this works so great, Matt, is because as long as I own the property, I never have to pay the tax. So converting it simply changes it from investment to my primary residence. And when it's my primary residence, if I live in it long enough and I sell it, I get to take a growing portion of that gain tax-free. So there's a strategy to convert properties from investment to your primary residence through retirement and get a bunch of that money tax-free. So there's sort of that's taking you from the beginning investor who's growing to the experienced investor who's all over the country in different ways to the end investor looking to simplify things. So Tim, here it's Matt's turn. Matt, what's the last D? I'm going to go with defer on this one, Bob. Tim, what do you think? He's wrong. Uh -huh. Oh, no way. Oh. <laughs> we set him up like that. Dave, I'm sorry. Dave, yeah, I was going to say, Dave throws the curveball. Maybe the <laughs> knuckleball, actually. Um, <laughs> Break in two directions. It's actually die. And I know that sounds kind of strange because nobody wants to, but everybody's going to. We're all heading that way. But here's what happens. Under current law, when you die, your heirs get what is called a step up in basis on the properties you own. So they get it as if they paid market value. And so when they inherit your properties, the tax literally disappears. You don't pay it, 
Your heirs don't pay it, but all of that gain is now in their hands, tax-free. So like I said, it's not my favorite way to pass along wealth, but if I got to do it, I'm going to make my kids very happy. And we've actually got investors where we're on the third generation of people doing this. You're exactly right, Matt. It's like a train ride. Because once you get on it, why would you ever want to get off? Because you can always continue that deferment. And then ultimately, when you die, your heirs get it. The tax disappears. That's the beauty of the 1031. Yeah. And so, so how does that tie into the sailboat? All right. That's the beautiful part. So I'm the child of farmers. My wife was from Minnesota. We lived in Denver. Where the heck was the ocean? Nowhere to be found. We didn't have a clue. But we looked and it looked like sailing was probably going to be the cheapest way to get from point A to point B. So it's okay. We're going to become sailors. We had to get to sailboat water, right, in order to start the train. So while we lived in Denver, we built up our portfolio, buying rentals, selling rentals, 1031 And occasionally, we would sell a primary residence. Now, when you sell a primary residence, you get to take, because we were a married couple, the first $500,000 in profit, tax-free. And you could do that once every two years. So, I mean, my gosh, if nobody takes anything away from today, except the idea that you have the ability to go buy a house, live in it for two years, and sell it, and the money's tax-free, that's an investing tactic that you can use your entire life. In our case, every time we sold one of those, we put the money in the buy the boat fund. So it was tax-free money. And then we were 1031 and along. Before we left Denver, we converted one of our properties to a primary residence. And then two years later, when we left, we sold it. And that money again was tax-free. Meanwhile, we 1031 all of the rest of our portfolio to Stanford, Connecticut. Stanford's on the water. It's awesome. Long Island Sound. The thing that we forgot was that we were praying to let God move us to sailboat water. We forgot to use the qualifier, warm mm -hmm. sailboat water. Right. And so after a year, they went, okay, nope, this is not going to work. But we had started building our portfolio there. And again, living in a property and then moving out of it and converting a property from investment into our primary residence. So the next part of the strategy began 1031 in again to a different geography. And we started looking at Southwest Florida. So we moved our entire portfolio to Southwest Florida, converted a property there. And by that time, we had enough money to buy our sailboat with cash from all of those primary residences. Tax free. And we moved aboard the boat within a week of our 10 year goal that we set in 1994. And we financed 10 years of living on our boat and raising four sons with income that included a bunch of deferred tax by from our vacation rental portfolio. So we basically bought the sailboat, moved on the sailboat, and had a great time without ever paying a penny in tax on any of our real estate adventures. So you own the boat free and clear from all of the profits. You're in the warm water. What what kept you there for 10 years? That commodity of time. I tell you, my bank is so full of memories that there's no amount of cash that will ever replace that. And our boys identify as boat boys. Even though we're back on land, they think of themselves as boat kids. So I mean, it's just, it's not for everybody because not everybody's a water person. But maybe it's a ranch. Maybe it's a self-sustaining garden. Maybe it's just something where you can afford to homeschool your kids. Or maybe it's just a lifestyle that you want to be able to travel internationally. Your portfolio's back here working for you. And a lot of the income that's being generated is courtesy of Uncle Sam letting you keep it. So let's 
talk about how this expands out. You're obviously consistently able to find deals, both on the investment side, on the primary side, converting them back and forth. What was your methodology for finding your deals? You know, way, way, way back in the day. Do you remember the guy named Carlton Sheets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was like kind of the first info guru of real estate investing. Said all the same things that everybody else is saying today. It was just in a different way. One of the things, though, that he said that was different that I really liked was that he talked about never investing more than 15 minutes away from your house. Because you know the area, you recognize deals better. And quite honestly, I still see a lot of wisdom in that. I know the world's a smaller place, and I know that it is easier to look and get people, get boots on the ground in other places. But the point really is that you've got to have really good intel coming out from those places. Otherwise, you're going to be scrambling to know whether you really do have good information or not. So boots on the ground, we took, darn it, we had to take periodic trips to Florida to make sure and find the right properties. I mean, you know, by the way, you know what, the, you, know what you call those? Tax you know write-offs. What, yeah. You know what you call those? Tax write-offs, right? So, yeah, I, so I really, we always looked, tried to look locally as much as we could. And you just cannot buy anything unless you really stress test them and make sure that they can overcome a doubt. I have a ton of investors who lost 80% of their wealth in 2008. You know, every one of them that will, did not have to sell their property is now worth multiple millions because they have stress tested it up. So they kept their debt leverage low enough and they made sure they kept it on where their income was going to be coming. They didn't have to lose it. So we always tried to make the numbers a little work. We always tried to invest where we can really know the markets. I mean, it's as simple as that. Yeah. So you're you're obviously out keeping eyes and ears open. Agents are bringing stuff to you. Wholesalers, investors are bringing stuff to you. And you're literally just making this work where you live. And as you're moving quite a bit, right? You mentioned Minnesota, you mentioned Denver, you mentioned Connecticut, you mentioned Florida. You're just buying deals in those areas. Now, for the listener, this is happening over 25 years or something like that, not over a year or two. So you're staying in a place for a while and then making your moves. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, you know, there's a quintessential model for this are military people. Because they start a posting somewhere, they get really excellent military benefits. So they buy their first property. But when they leave, they don't sell it. They rent it to some friends who then rent it to some friends. And now they've got their first rental. What are they going to do when they get to their next posting? Buy another property. And they're next and they're next and they're next. And we've worked with several of them over the years where they start to get close to that 20 year retirement. And then we start asking the question, where do you want to retire to? What's next for him? For one guy, he was going to do consulting work in Virginia. So we took properties in Washington, San Diego, he's on the coast in Texas, maybe Houston, and one in the Panhandle of Florida. And we sold every one of them and 1031 them all close to Virginia. He's got a management company that really consists of his own properties. Yeah. It's beautiful kick for them. Yeah, that's awesome. And so basically, you know, you're you're going about it. Like, how do you determine with all these moves, how do you determine when's a good time to move? You know, my wife jokes and says, you know, for you, Dave, whenever it's time to redecorate, you want to move. I don't think I'm quite that bad. But, um, you know, for us, it was really situational. Uh, we knew that it was time to go and get to water, so we moved to water. We knew that we were within a couple of years, it was time to get to where we wanted to buy the sailboat and stage it. Um, I don't know that there is a magical time other than when your wanderlust takes a hold of you. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So you spent 10 years on the boat. Just curious, being a father, like we're starting to travel a lot more, going out of country with our kids. How did you know when it was time? Was it, hey, a new wanderlust appeared? Was it more education-based for the kids? 
Yeah, for us, it was really the education component. So one of the really cool things that we were able to do, because we were on the boat, is we homeschooled our kids. They had such an advantage. And I'll put in a shameless plug for the state of Florida here. But in the state of Florida, any child, whether you are homeschooled or in public school, can start to take college courses free as early as the age of 14. So we said, my gosh, if we could put our kids in college and made that the homeschool curriculum, they could have their associate's degrees by the time they were 18. So that was kind of the goal. So we ended up coming back on land when it became time to access higher level professors and that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, usually your kids are probably really young. When kids are teenagers, they start to speak to you very clearly about what they want. I, I would submit maybe even a little before that. I have a 13-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 3-year-old, and a 1-year-old. So I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is- Did you ever do timeouts with him? Put oh, him in yeah. a timeout place? Oh, yeah. Okay, so on the sailboat, the timeout place is we would just tie the dinghy off behind the boat and make him go sit in the dinghy. So we never even had to hear him. It was awesome. <laughs> That's so funny. And so really, I mean, it was it was our college education that let, led you back onto land. Give us some of the highlights, some of the memories that you had with your kids. Well, there's probably about seven or eight times of almost dying that that's kind of cool memories. Nothing bonds a family like almost dying. Um, you know, for us, it was, we weren't so much about the travel as we were the destination. And so a lot, there, there are people who like to just travel around, but there's also something really cool about going to a destination and then plugging in. Whether that's Key West or Cat Key in the Bahamas, or whether it's Taos, New Mexico, to really get the, the deep marrow of what the community has to offer. Because travelers and vacationers don't get that. You have to stay there. So I would say our greatest memories are the people in the communities that we met. One of our greatest sticks to make sure that our boys grew up social was that any time a new boat would come into the anchorage we were at or the marina where we were at, we would bake them cookies. And so we became known as the Foster Cookie Association. Now, good news about that, we learned how to be really social. Better news for our boys, they were on the lookout all the time for new boats. But what was funny was even a couple of years after we landed, we found, we got contacted from some old friends of ours who were sailing who met some people in the Outer Islands and the Turks and Caicos. And as they were talking, they both started to mention these crazy people in Key West, this family that they had met. And this other man, they said, wait, did they bring you cookies? And so the Foster Cookie Association is still alive and well throughout the Caribbean. Those are memories that they're going to stick with us. That's incredible. Do you think your kids might, at least one or two of them, might carry on the tradition when they're older? You know, they all have wanted to go sailing with us again. Um, life tends to conspire, so you kind of have to see what's happening. My oldest, though, is a uh, he's a woofer. Uh, the World Organic Organization of Organic Farming. So he travels the world in organic farming. And his self-stated goal right now is to destroy capitalistic farming tendencies in America and return us to return us to sustenance farming and fishing. So if anybody's going to jump on a boat and raise the rebel flag, it'll be him. But uh, yeah, we'll see. One of the things I know often is associated with homeschooling is a, is a lack of academics. And, and you mentioned the social element too. What were some of the ways, because your kids have ended up doing some pretty cool things, what are some of the ways that you fought against the academic, maybe lack of rigor that's associated with homeschool? That's a great question. Um, I think that I'm actually not sure that we had to fight against it because I think that just by nature, what we did was far more rigorous. When you look back at what you did in high school, how much of your time was spent 
standing in line, waiting at the locker room, chatting up the cheerleaders, practicing for sports. I mean, come on, academics was really kind of a distant second. So for us, we made it number one priority was reading. Learn to read and the world is open. The world is yours. And then secondly, as soon as they hit that magical age, we'd read all kinds of studies that said that your last year of uh, high school, or your, I'm sorry, your first year and a half of college is not any harder than your last year of high school. So we said, fine, let's just skip the last couple years of high school and jump right into college. So they got all the rigor of college education, both online and in seed. It was kind of surreal because my wife actually went with one of my sons when he was 12 because the professor refused to believe that he was actually in the class. So she would have to go to class with his 12 year old and uh, sit with him while he did his thing. But I think learning to read is the best way to fight that. And then secondly, involve them in college as much as you can, if that's an opportunity. It's a great head start. One of the things we're really passionate about with being on the Freedom Chasers is helping people get to where you got to, where you got to live on a boat with your kids and have the experiences you wanted to have. I like to rebel against the traditional notion that it takes a hundred doors and some crazy amount of systems and, and houses to do that. If you had to give advice to our audience of what is the, I don't want to say fastest, but what is like the fewest number of transactions you could envision, the simplest way to go from zero passive income to where you could live on a boat with your family? What would be the path? Such an awesome question, because I've actually been thinking about that exact thing. I'm with you. This whole bigger is better mode that everybody's in these days, I think is the recipe for disaster for people. And the Bible's very clear when it says no man can serve two masters. He's going to love one and hate the other, or he'll worship one and he'll chafe under the other one. And I think as we start to grow our kingdoms of real estate bigger and bigger, all we're doing is creating another master. We spend our time, for me, I'm going to spend my time in the cockpit worrying about, is my property being managed correctly? instead of watching that dolphin surface next to me. So I'm totally with you. The idea, and there's a bunch of things out there. I, you know the podcast better than I do, the, the minimalist people that are out there. What's the least that I can get by on? Now, for me, I'm a creature of comfort. And so minimalist does not mean spam. <laughs> minimalist means the minimum that I can do and be comfortable live the way that I want, buy that good bottle of wine, you know, see my kids in designer tennis shoes so I can laugh at them, whatever it is. So um, it's a hard answer. Um, when we first started out, our initial goal was that I wanted to have 10 properties, free and clear, generated in that $1,000 a month. And get 10 properties. Yep. And we could have done that over 20 years. And that would have been a fine goal. Now, I don't know if $100,000 is enough for you or for someone else. I don't know. But I do know this, that when the boat was free and clear, because we had done the primary residence exemptions, it really doesn't take a lot more money to live really well. And for us and at the peak, I can tell you, we were doing it with four vacation rentals, a duplex, and that was generating the cash flow. Now, these were all waterfront rentals, and we were they had boats on the dock in the backyard. So we rented the house and the boats. I mean, they were they were nice rentals. But we had four of those in a duplex. And then to build for the future, I had 100 acres of land that we developed into a subdivision. But that did not provide cash flow. That's our future. So it really doesn't take that much, does it? No. No. For for me, it was three houses. Was was zero to, you know, freedom. And we just had someone on earlier today that a single property, which was like 40 houses in the middle of the in New Mexico desert as Airbnbs. One property, 250K net cash flow. And, you know, 
I think redefining what it means is so helpful for people so they don't put themselves in a 40, 50 year grind that that leaves them dry. One of the things that I really appreciate about what you're saying is being able to watch the dolphins and being present to your family. What are some of the systems? Because once you have rental properties, it doesn't mean it's automatically not. Passive income doesn't really exist in real estate. But what have you done to make it passive enough to where you get to enjoy the dolphin moments with your kids? So when we were, um, the, the greatest amount of management we were at was during that time. Uh, excuse me. And during that time, we were so early in the vacation rental market that our houses were on the front page of the boat. That's how early we were. So for us, the key was marketing through Verbo, which we could manage. And then we had one on-site manager. Now, I chose to hire one person solely for me rather than a management company just because I know that person. I can look them in the eye. A management company, employees come and go. You're really managing the manager of the employees. So for us, it was really that. It was making sure that we had someone on the ground that I could talk to anytime and that I knew I could trust. And then, man, today, I honestly kind of lust after all of these incredible platforms that exist. It's just insane. Uh, but unfortunately, man, the vacation market isn't exciting me these days because I discovered raw land. And raw land never talks back. <laughs> so, and and my opinion is mobile home parks are the closest thing to raw land you can get when you don't own the houses. So, absolutely. Well, you know what they call every mobile home park down here in Florida? Every mobile home park is just a land development waiting to happen. Yeah. So, I mean, there's your future down upside, right? Buying mobile home parks, they're cash cows, they're easy to manage. And they're all this major, large, multifamily subdivision waiting to happen whenever you want to pull the trigger. Exactly. Absolutely. Especially with the technology of Boxable and then these houses that are going to be able to come down the pipe. You know, land, become it has a whole different take once building becomes cheap. And building's never been cheap. But I don't know that it's, it, I think it's going to be in our lifetime where building's going to be cheap. And that's going to change the nature of a lot of things. I think the next 20 years, if you say, I cannot wait until I can go buy a chunk of land and move a 3D printer on site and print my homes in a week. That just blows my mind. But it's one, one, or, one or two people. The 3D printer, one or two people, subdivision built in a week. You know, we can mourn the loss of jobs. That's definitely true. And yet the affordability scenario in the country is going to change. Which in turn, hopefully, if we're a socially moral conscious society, is going to result in a new focus for everybody on quality of time rather than quantity at the job. Yeah. 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 I'm not John Lennon, but it would be nice to kind of move that direction a little bit. Totally. So after your kids go to college... You've now bought a ranch, so you went from boater to rancher? Well, we've got some agricultural land that we that we use, but I'm actually looking at because it's funny, some another podcast that I just came out last week and everybody's been roasting me on Facebook because I mentioned that when we got married in nineteen eighty eight, we put together a bucket list of our goals. And the one thing that was not on our bucket list was sailing. So I don't know how that occupied the book of our life. But what was on our bucket list that we have not yet done was to buy a cattle horse ranch. So these properties that I'm developing are going to be 1031 eventually into a cattle horse ranch and we'll do the exact same thing over and over again. Amazing. How much tax do you think you've saved in the course of your 25 year investing career? Several hundred thousand dollars. I doubt if it's as much as a million. Might be close. Uh, actually, it's probably over a million if you also start to include all of the benefits. Recap recapture depreciation. Exactly. Uh, because we've always got that benefit. That's reduced our current income. Yeah, it's probably well over a million dollars. I mean, it's a bunch. But 
with the 1031, you don't get that in your hands to play with. Yeah. You really have to have the discipline to let life work for you. Yeah. But then you wake up one day and you go, wow, I've had a great life. And I wasn't greedy at the beginning. Amazing. So how long, like how, like, so when you don't pay taxes, because they're being deferred by these obviously government sponsored programs, you're, you're compressing time because you're allowed to keep your money. And so then you're able to invest it. And so you're, you're buying your time back. How much time do you think you saved in being able to spend these kid memories with your kids by not, not having to pay those taxes? Oh, I think it easily cut down 20 years of my life. I think to get to where I would have gotten to, what we did is usually something that people will work 30 years for, and then they'll get their kids out of the house, and then they'll retire, and they'll go live on the sailboat. We met thousands of those people. We were able to do it in 10 years, so we could do it while our kids were still in the house. Yeah. So literally, it chopped 20 years out yeah. of the process. If you had to do it again today, how fast could you do it? Oh, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> you know, it would probably, I could maybe shave a little bit off that. Depends on the market, right? Sure. If if you would have been asking me this in 2012, you know, I'd say, shoot, I could do that in four years. You know, ask me in 2008 or right now. Right. The appreciation is a huge thing. Yep. And we're seeing some stuff stall out. Um, but I think that for us, the biggest limiting factor and for most people, it's going to be this as well, is the tax-free component of the primary resident sales. So first of all, you and your family have to be willing to move every two years or so, because that's what speeds it up. So, and then you're going to be confined why, to at why least Why does that speed it up? So let's talk about that, because you're buying a property, say at 300000 and while you live there, it goes to be worth five or 600000 now, it's one thing to say, okay, they, it grew in value because you bought it way below market value. But let's say it was true market appreciation. The next house they buy is going to be at the new place, right? Sure. Well, absolutely. Maybe. But this is where the other shoe drops. Yeah. And for the sake of my wife, I try not to talk about it because she throws it back up at me that we have probably lived in a renovated work in progress <laughs> for 15 of the 20 years. Right, there you go. I see what it you're saying. It just is what it is. Yeah. Because remember the 1031 is most effective when you're growing. Yeah. So we take the tax-free dollars, we go buy another fixer upper. Yep. The happiest day in her life was the one when I did the renovation first before we moved in. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, no, this is incredible. So that's why it speeds it up. Because you're selling at the top and then you're buying back in properties that you can force the, the uh, appreciation. So your your real benefit, and, and this is very true, like your real benefit is you're buying distressed assets and fixing them up. And so you might buy a property for 200, put 100 into it. Now it's worth five. So you've created $200,000 of equity based on your vision for the property. And so every two years, you're creating another hundred to $400,000 of additional equity, plus whatever market lift is happening. That's exactly right. That's it. I mean, you could wait longer if you want. Uh, but if you've got that forced appreciation thing going, you want to do it as compressed as you can to greater than two years, because that's the minimum you have to live, but as little above that as possible yeah. to take advantage of the, of the forced appreciation and then do it again. And you're probably needing to buy these properties at a d deep enough discount too to be able to get the lending. Otherwise, for a lot of people, if every two years they're running a construction project, that's a lot of capital out. Now their down payments come out in the form of buying the property, but at some point, like I mean, you're you're putting another fifty to two hundred thousand into each of these properties. How'd you guys manage the capital? Well, you've got a bank already started. It's tax free dollars. You can use it if you want. The other beautiful thing about primary residences is that there's still so many conforming and FHA programs, we were putting down three and a half percent. So the money we had to put down was next to nothing. And then if you're doing your renovations as you go, you know, you say, honey, I bought five more two by fours today. Let's go. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's kind of an extreme, but you can do it as you go. And you're doing this early nineties, right? Yeah. So rate environment 
wasn't at two or three percent. What were rate environments like? As oh, you Lord have mercy. Right before I started, 13 percent was considered good. Come on. Anybody that wants to complain, call me and I'll bring you to Jesus about this. You know, the rates we have now are not bad. What's making this environment awkward is that not the rates. Right. It's that sellers yeah. are not bending enough on price to make the numbers work. And so once something has to happen, either rates have to come down or prices have to come down or rents have to go up. And as long as one of those three things happens, we're fine. But rates have gone up. Now they're, that's it. We're done with that. Sellers are not reducing their prices because there's still so much real estate in America that's owned for cash that they're going to hang on a while longer. So we've got to see the economy really start cooking so that we can see rents go up. And isn't that exactly what we're seeing? Rents are escalating like crazy. Incredible. Dave, thank you so much for giving us a glimpse in your life and business, for sharing the stories about the dolphins and the kids out there behind the boat, for showing us that we could save a lot, a lot of money on taxes by deferring it through 1031 exchange, cut you estimate 20 years maybe off of what it'd take to, to have financial freedom, which is what we're all about. So guys, if you're listening, write something down, whether it's 1031 exchanges or even just how you create your lifestyle and your path, tell somebody you know so they can hold you accountable. And that way, guys, freedom is, is so close if you take action daily. Before you know it, you're going to be free. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you guys on the next episode.